Since the dawn of humanity, we as a species have constantly been on the lookout for ways to alter our mental state. Fortunately, for those who do not find reality to be exciting enough, nature has provided a plethora of plants to alter that reality to best suit one's current needs. Although over the years, many of these plants, or derivatives of these plants, such as cannabis, opium, certain varieties of sage, etc., have garnered a great deal of attention from governments and law enforcement agencies around the world, and have subsequently become illegal depending on your location, there are still a few which, with some persistence and little know-how, can be used to distract one from the monotonous drudge of day-to-day -day life. One such example of this is muscamol, a derivative of the culturally iconic mushroom Amanita muscaria. In today's episode, we shall take a look at the effects of this chemical, the legends that have grown up around it, whether any of these legends are true, and how one might go about obtaining it for the purpose of scientific research, and only scientific research, of course. Given that people have been experimenting with Amanata muscaria, and by extension, muscamol for thousands of years, we obviously don't know who the first person was to discover its interesting properties. However, history is replete with stories of its usage, some of which go back as far as nearly 10,000 years, possibly. One origin story claims that the Sami people, indigenous to the northern parts of Norway, Sweden, Finland, and the Kola Peninsula of Russia, noticed many years ago that reindeer were rather fond of this particular mushroom. Not only that, but when the reindeer consumed this delicacy, oh, they would act in, shall we say, pretty peculiar ways. According to a rather splendid article on DrugsDiscoveryToday.com, eating the fungi makes them behave drunkenly, run about aimlessly, and make strange noises. Head twitching is also common. Once those in charge of the reindeer herds realized the correlation between mushroom consumption and this behavior, they decided to try some of the mushrooms for themselves. The trouble is, as well as containing muscamol, Amanita muscaria also contains ibotenic acid. One of the many notable properties of this acid is that if consumed in large doses, it can cause unpleasant symptoms such as vomiting and diarrhea in humans. Somehow, and we must confess that we did not look into this too deeply, the Sami discovered that reindeer act as a natural filter for this acid and if you drink their piss, you can experience all of the high with much less of the low. After a little more research, we discovered that humans can also perform this feat of filtration, and local shamans would often eat the mushrooms and suffer the effects before giving out their urine for consumption by followers. Really. Interestingly, there is one school of thought which claims this mushroom is almost entirely responsible for the details surrounding the modern incarnation of Santa Claus. If you take the arguments put forward by those who believe this at face value and don't subject it too hard to any external fact-checking, the evidence is pretty compelling. Santa is, of course, well known for his distinctive red and white get-up, exactly the same color scheme sported by Amanita muscaria. Given that the now ubiquitous red and white Santa Claus was popularized by Coca-Cola at some point during the 1930s, this on its own seems somewhat unlikely. However, there are a few other things that lend the idea some credence. We have it on good authority that one of the effects brought on by this mushroom is a drifting, floating feeling, almost like you're flying. If you combine this with the unusual behavior of the reindeer, the geographical location, and the stories that shamans would distribute dried samples of this mushroom during the winter festival, and if the snow had risen high enough, they would deliver it down the chimney rather than through the more conventional door, then you can certainly see how this idea could have got wings, so to speak. The other hugely popular story about the history of this mushroom is a little less wholesome and involves invasion, raping, pillaging, and murdering. Legend has it that in order to achieve the famous Berserker Rage, for which the Vikings are so renowned, Viking soldiers would consume large quantities of Amanita muscaria before going into battle. Sadly, this story also has a bunch of holes in it. As the YouTube channel Fascinated by Fungi helpfully points out, Maskimol, the derivative of this mushroom that gets you high, is a dissociative sedative. While it may lead you to believe that you are flying or floating, it is very unlikely to fill you with blind rage. In fact, one of the most commonly reported side effects is drowsiness, and if you take too much, it can actually put you in a coma. Given that the Vikings allegedly consumed large amounts of these mushrooms when they were fresh, and as we discussed earlier, doing this would provide you with a set of rather unpleasant stomach issues, uh, you could quite successfully argue that taking the mushrooms before battle would be a really, really bad idea. After all, we imagine it would be quite difficult to win a war if most of your soldiers had slipped into a coma and lost control of their bowels. Whether or not both or either of these stories have any truth to them, it is certainly true that Amanita muscaria has been used by people wherever it can be found for various reasons for thousands of years. 
It has even found its way into video games such as Super Mario Brothers and Assassin's Creed, as well as being the go-to mushroom of choice for almost every fairy tale due to its iconic red and white coloring. But let's get on to how it works. How does it differ from, want of a better term, more conventional hallucinogenic mushrooms? And most importantly, does it have any practical, real-world applications outside of recreation? Let's start with the chemistry. So far in this video, we have mentioned a few chemicals, which, unless you are something of an expert in the field, probably are not that familiar to you. So let's take a look at what they are and what they do. Magic mushrooms, the ones that were responsible for the creation of a great deal of the more psychedelic music that came out of the 1960s, contain something called psilocybin. This, in and of itself, does not cause any sort of hallucinogenic effects in the human brain. However, once metabolized, a phosphate molecule is stripped away, creating psilocin. And that is when the fun begins. According to Science Direct, psilocin is an active metabolite that is formed when psilocybin, a tryptamine, is administered systemically. It has a biologically relevant affinity for serotonin receptors and is responsible for the observable acute effects after psilocybin administration. Psilocybin acts primarily on the 5-HT2A receptors in the body and is considered to be the main contributor to the mind-altering effects of classic psychedelics. What that means for the non-medical professionals is that it is detected by the human brain's dopamine receptors, but because it is not dopamine, it causes a variety of interesting effects. Amanita muscaria works really differently. Contrary to popular belief, these mushrooms contain only trace amounts of muscarine, the chemical once thought to be responsible for their hallucinogenic effects. However, what they do contain are muscimol, also known as pantherine or agarin, and ibotenic acid. So, what are these compounds, and what do they do? Google tells us that muscimol is a colorless or white solid that has the following effects, sedative, hypnotic, depressant, and hallucinogenic. As we already know, people have been enjoying its hallucinogenic properties for many years, but are there any genuine medical uses for muscimol? Well, it turns out there may very well be quite a few. However, due to the misclassification of muscimol as poisonous, research is still very much in its early stages. As far as we understand it, muscimol activates the GABA-A, or gamma aminobutyric acid receptors in the brain. Essentially, GABA-A inhibits the ability of cells to send and receive various impulses, such as those responsible for pain and fear, which may explain the calming, disconnected feeling that comes from taking Amanita muscaria. In an interview with Technology Networks, Jeff Stevens, CEO of Psyched Wellness, a Canadian life science company working to identify compounds that are not mainstream in psychedelics, said, We believe the reason muscimol has not been studied to a large degree is because it has been mislabeled as poisonous and as such was overlooked. As a result, there haven't been many scientific studies conducted on muscimol. He continued, We believe muscimol could show positive indications for various mental and physical health issues, including sleep, insomnia, addiction, and pain. Our initial product will be a tincture designed to provide users with a calming and relaxing effect. We were also fortunate enough to speak with another expert in this particular field of research who is currently finishing a paper on the use of muscimol as a long-term painkiller. Although he was reluctant to share detailed findings before publication, he did say that the initial results looked promising indeed. Given that the world of medicine has been searching for effective non-opioid painkillers for quite some time, this compound seems to have the potential to become very useful indeed. But what about the other main compounds that these mushrooms contain? What about ibotenic acid? Well, there are conflicting views. As we mentioned a couple of times already, this stuff can cause serious gastrointestinal issues. But what else do we know about it? If used in certain ways, it can actually be quite devastating. When conducting neurobiological analysis on animals such as rats, scientists sometimes need a way of causing specific brain damage, such as creating lesions to mimic the effects of Alzheimer's. If injected into a specific area of the brain, ibotenic acid causes this damage very effectively. Understandably, some members of the mushroom-enjoying community find the presence of this acid in their mental stimulants of choice somewhat unnerving, but as one Mushroom Forum user put it, will Amanita muscaria burn holes in your brain? Well, no it won't. As the rational among you will have already realized, there is a huge difference between ingesting something which contains a potentially dangerous chemical and injecting that chemical in its purest form directly into your brain. Furthermore, we were unable to find any conclusive evidence that ibotenic acid actually crosses the blood-brain barrier when ingested. If it doesn't, and we must reiterate that research into this mushroom is still very much in the early stages, then it would be unable to affect your brain at all. 
Still, removing as much ibotenic acid as possible before consuming this mushroom is undoubtedly a good idea, especially because it can be broken down into muscimol, greatly increasing the high you get from taking it. For those of you who might be interested in this process purely for the purposes of knowledge gathering, you'll probably be pleased to discover that it can be done without coming into contact with any urine, be it reindeer or human. According to Dr. Gordon Walker, founder of the YouTube channel that we mentioned earlier, fascinated by fungi, quote, you do not have to drink reindeer pee to access muscimol better living through chemistry. Dry it out, boil it, add a little lemon juice, and boom, you have muscimol. He goes on to say that the resultant brew, with the mushrooms removed, can be drunk as a tea. For anybody interested in trying out some of these mushrooms as part of their early morning fry-up, it is possible, if a little time-consuming, to do this safely. According to Dr. Walker, if you place your mushrooms in a pan of cold water, bring that water to the boil, pour the water out, and repeat the process, they will then be perfectly safe to eat and should not provide you with any unwanted effects. So, now it's time to move on to the part that we expect some of you might have been waiting for. How much trouble will you get in if, for research purposes, you decide to gather some of these mushrooms and experiment with them? As with anything like this, it really depends on where you live. According to a legal advice guide that we found online, in the United Kingdom, Amanita muscaria is not a controlled substance and is therefore legal to possess and cultivate. However, it is illegal to supply or sell it for human consumption as it is considered a poisonous substance under the 1971 Misuse of Drugs Act. This is definitely not legal advice, but assuming you source and prepare them yourself, it doesn't appear that you would be in breach of the law. As for other countries, it's always better to check the laws in your region, but if you live in any of the United States apart from Louisiana, you'd appear to be fine. Although Amanita muscaria is not FDA approved, it seems that it can be sold as long as it contains a not for human consumption notice. Those of you from Australia, Romania, the Netherlands, and Thailand, however, you're just straight out of luck. Thanks for watching.